So hi guys, my name is Mansi Anand, and I welcome you to this series called RBI Twenty Four Seven. So in this series, as you know, that we discuss a set of five questions which are related to finance and economics, current affairs. So if you are preparing for any competitive exam, do watch this video as it can benefit you. Right. So let's not waste any time and move straight away to the lecture. But before doing that, I would like to ask you guys to subscribe to our channel. So, if this is the first video of our channel that you are watching, do not forget to hit the subscribe button. It is going to provide you with access to a lot of good content, including videos by many teachers, many uh, teachers who are expert in their fields and covering different subjects. Right after that, do not forget to press this bell icon, which can help you to get notified whenever a new video comes up. After that, you can also join our Telegram group. on this group you can post all your doubts and queries and we'll try to get back to you as soon as possible after that here is your question number 1 i hope the screen is perfectly visible okay this question talks about following are some details about financial and operating uh, leverage which are the correct ones four statements given to you you have to select the correct ones so guys you can pause the video and Uh, read the statements carefully and then decide your answer so guys this is one topic which has been provided by one of you in the comments so i hope uh, you get help with this topic moving ahead to the solution and the solution for this question is option a option a means <coughs> statement 1 and 2 are correct rest 3 and 4 are not correct right so first of all let us understand the meaning of the word leverage what is the meaning of word leverage leverage is a, is a strategy that a company uses to acquire assets or boost its profits right you can see here companies use it to either increase their assets or cash flows or returns though it can magnify losses so guys basically in simple terms leverage is something that helps you to increase your profits or uh, build up your assets but in the process it can have some downsides too right so here we are going to talk about two leverages financial leverage and operating leverage now firstly talking about operating leverage see operating leverage tells you that what is the cost structure of the company uh, how much are the fixed costs how much are the variable costs so what is the meaning of fixed and variable cost i think most of you are aware but if you are not in a brief, in in brief fixed costs are those costs that are not dependent upon the scale uh, you produce unless and until you change your scale of production to a very high degree uh, your fixed costs they do not change for example if you have taken land or if you have taken a building on rent so that you can run a factory into it then doesn't matter if you produce 1000 units or 2000 units your rent is going to be same right but let's say that particular building has a capacity to put machinery uh, with which you can produce only 5000 units so that is a limit and if you need to produce more than that then you will have to find a bigger building so in that case the change or the uh, the change in the uh, level of production is very high to increase or decrease your fixed cost so majorly uh, fixed cost they remain same with some increase in your increase or decrease in your level of production whereas variable cost it changes with every unit for example if you are producing 1000 units and obviously you require require some raw material for it but if you produce 2000 units you require a double amount of raw material right that increases your variable costs so fixed and variable and there are some other cost uh, which lie between these uh, which are semi fixed some component is variable right so we are not going there right now so basically operating leverage tells you about the cost structure of company and it it focuses on the fixed cost so basically they tell you higher the fixed cost higher is the operating led uh, operating leverage right see fixed cost we say that unless and until you increase your level of production it is going to be fixed so uh, we think that it is it is not going to change so it is not something uh, which adds to a businessman's uh, a businessman's burden or a management's burden but fixed cost can be dangerous in case 
in case the business is not doing well because even if you shut down your business right you're not you do not have the money you intend to close down your business right and you cannot afford to produce so at zero level of production you need not worry about the variable cost because if you're not producing you uh, you do not need to buy raw material but fixed costs are still going to be there you will have to pay the rent or whatever the other fixed costs are right so basically uh, they obviously add to your profits because uh, they provide you with the benefit of economies of scale since they do not increase uh, at, at uh, since they do not increase rapidly and uh, a very high degree of change is required for fixed costs to change right so they add to your profits but they can also be dangerous when the business is not doing well right because variable costs they are going to go up and down in the same proportion as uh, you are producing right so operating leverage tells you about the cost structure coming to the financial leverage it talks about the debt component that what is the amount of loan that you have raised right so if you want to start a business you can put your own money or you can take a loan from bank right so both of the options have their own pros and cons if you go with your own money obviously uh, if if you lose then you need not worry about the loss because you do not have to pay to anyone else but let's say you have taken debt or you have taken a loan from bank then you you have a fixed charge that no matter you make profit or loss you have to pay banks money back right so same is the financial leverage so this debt it obviously adds to your profit so basically leverage is something that adds to your profit and uh, at the same time has some sort of downside or some sort of danger or threat associated with it so debt component ki aapne loan kitna liya hua hai higher the debt higher would be the financial leverage right pros and cons of both you can see here higher operate, operating leverage means profits increase with small change in sales that if you change sales that you have a see higher operating leverage means higher fixed expense and if you make a small change in sales that if your sales rise by a small proportion then it is going to add to your profits because your fixed cost is not going to increase so this is one benefit higher financial leverage if you have higher debt component in your capital structure earning share of uh, earning share of shareholders will increase because obviously if you uh, raise money through uh, Uh, issue uh, if you raise money by issuing new shares that obviously means dilution of your control or dilution of shareholding that means more owners that obviously means more money for you to run the company but that simultaneously that also means that there are more people to have the share of profit so you can understand it in a way that let's say uh, you and two other friends three friends are going out to party right so they have let's say rupees 750 to party okay but after that two other friends join them who are also having let's say 250 each now obviously they have some more money but they have some other people that they have to share their party or let's say uh, these guys they go to Uh, dominoes they order a pizza obviously they have more money to buy a pizza but obviously there are there are um, there are more people to share that pizza right to to have the to have a stake in that particular asset or in that earning right so same is the concept in case of shareholding right so if you have higher shareholding that means more money more owners which is going to reduce the profit for one person right so higher debt means earning share earning of one owner is going to remain same right after that cons leverage inherits risk of bankruptcy fixed expenses extend the break even point for a business okay one more point here this 
ऑपरेटिंग लेवरेज और फिक्स्ड एक्सपेंस इट हेल्प्स यू टू कैलकुलेट दैट व्हाट इज द ब्रेक इवन पॉइंट फॉर अ बिजनेस व्हाट इज मीनिंग ऑफ ब्रेक इवन पॉइंट ब्रेक इवन मींस द पॉइंट द द द रेवेन्यू वेयर द बिजनेस इज नॉट मेकिंग एनी प्रॉफिट नॉट मेकिंग एनी लॉस दैट मींस व्हाट एवर कॉस्ट इट इज इंकरिंग इट इज रिकवरिंग इट बट इट इज नॉट मेकिंग एनी प्रॉफिट तो सो नो प्रॉफिट नो लॉस सिचुएशन इज नोन एज ब्रेक इवन पॉइंट सो फिक्स्ड इफ हायर इफ द fixed expenses they are higher they are going to extend the break even point that means you need more sales to generate profit right so this is about leverage coming to the statements okay operating leverage used to determine break even point correct option after that operating leverage is an indication of how company's costs are structured correct option financial leverage is an indication wrong because we just discussed that operating leverage is correct here after that a consultancy firm might have high operating leverage as compared to a manufacturing company so this is wrong because there are more chances that the manufacturing company is going to have fixed expenses which are higher than consultancy firm because obviously they need more assets they need more space which the consultancy firm might not need so it would have been correct if it would have been reversed moving ahead to second question for today here is the second question which says there is a country x in africa which had issued bonds 9 years back now the interest rates in country are showing upward tendency to compensate for the rising inflation the government to okay one line here is missing that the maturity of that bond that the government issues 9 year back let's say it is a 10 year or so the missing part is that the bond is a 10 year old bond right so 9 years back it was issued it is a 10 year old bond so interest rates are showing upward tendency to compensate for the rising inflation which tells us there is a rising inflation and interest rates are also rising government wants to prevent a huge outflow in redemption of bonds and this thinking of converting them into longer term bonds right which type of risk will the country face in such situation moving ahead to the solution and the solution here is option b option b means roll over risk so roll over risk it occurs when so it is basically a type of refinancing risk refinancing risk although a broader term because it covers some other aspects roll over risk when one when issuer of one security has to has to extend the position by replacing that particular security with a similar security then the risk that that particular issuer faces is the roll over risk now okay this seems a little complicated let's try to understand this in the terms of this particular country now this country 9 uh, years back it had issued bonds and it's a 10 year old bond it is approaching its maturity company uh, the country country x needs to pay back the amount or redeem the amount to the bond holders but they cannot but they want to prevent huge cash outflow that is why they are thinking that let us replace these bonds with some other longer term bonds let's say another 10 year old 10 year old bond and give them to bond holders in return for these bonds right so now in this case if the interest rates they have increased in time so obviously uh, the interest rate on this bond or the coupon rate that the country provides to its bond holders it was decided at the rate uh, at the rate which was prevailing 9 years back but now it will have to provide compensation to the new to the bond holders at the current level because obviously they are not going to be satisfied with the interest rate which was there 9 years back right so they will need to increase the coupon rate that they have to provide or they will have to increase the reward that they are going to provide to the bond holders if they want to replace it right so some sort of uh, some similar sort of scene happened uh, between RBI and when RBI recently tried to 
issue some new bonds so investors they sensing the inflation in the market they wanted to have a higher rate of uh, they wanted to have higher yield higher interest rates and rbi wanted to keep the yields down right so there was a conflict investors were not ready to buy and the bonds had to be uh, uh, bought by the underwriters so some similar sort of conflict so this is roll over risk that when you are trying to roll over the bonds roll over the security then the interest rates they might have been increased which can be, which can pose as a new expense for the issuer or as a higher cost burden for the issuer right in this case the issuer is the country roll uh, okay roll over risk associated with refinancing of debt that the uh, specifically that the interest charge for a new loan will be higher than on the old it can be a good proposition or the rollover risk can be really low if the interest rates they have come down because now the issuer would have to uh, issue or issuer would have to provide a low yield or a low coupon rate right so generally so guys i'm using two terms coupon rate or yield uh, I, uh, let me just remind you that these are not synonymous but since uh, yield for an investor is obviously determined hugely by coupon rates so uh, that is why since uh, i'm using them in a same format or a same direction so generally the shorter term maturing debt the greater the borrower's roll over risk right so the shorter the term of your debt the more you would have to roll it over and the more is the risk roll uh, roll over is commonly faced by countries and companies when a loan or debt obligation is about to mature and needs to be converted or rolled over into a new debt similar situation that we just learned about lenders are often uh, unwilling to uh, lend at lower rates because they want a higher compensation especially during a financial crisis just as i told you the case of rbi when collateral values drop right after that roll over risk also exists in derivatives where futures or options contracts must be rolled over to later maturities as near term contracts expire in the so do you remember the oil price drop when oil prices went negative um, so when it happened it was some similar sort of situation was at play there because many people who ha who had oil futures they wanted to roll over their position or they wanted a new contract to replace the existing contract for which they were providing so, uh, they were uh, they were willing to provide such compensation to the buyers of oil right so roll over risk also exists in derivatives basically you are just you are just looking to replace one sort of debt or one sort of security with another security and for that you uh, if you have to face a higher cost then there is roll over risk right so this was also one question which was asked okay let me just check who asked this question okay this question was asked by prashant sagar so prashant i hope now you are clear with it moving ahead to the next question for today okay third question which talks about stock split and you have to select the correct statement about it moving ahead to the solution solution is option e okay option e right so we'll discuss the statement let us first discuss the meaning of stock split okay, uh, let's take an example there is a company called a limited it has a share worth rupees 100 right now let's say it has 10000 of such shares in the market which gives it a market cap of 10 lakh right total amount total value it gives it a value of 10 lakh right now there are, the shares are priced at 100 so an investor who is looking to buy a share which is below 50 might not go for buying the share of this company so this company thinks that the trading in our shares is not high we want to increase the activity the trading activity of our shares for this purpose it thinks that let us divide so one share which is priced at rupees 100 let us divide this one share into 10 parts so basically a person who is holding one share 
is going to have 10 shares now. A person who is holding 2 shares is going to have 20 shares now. Person who is holding 10 shares is going to have 100 shares now. Right? So, basically multiplied by 10. So, but the price is going to drop. Right? So, now they are converting the they are reducing the share price to rupees 10 right they are reducing the share price to rupees 10 which increases the number of shares that are floating in the market to 1 lakh now if you multiply 10 into 1 lakh it gives you the same valuation of 10 lakh so valuation is not affected because one thing is reduced, the share price is reduced and the number of shares that are floating in market that are available for trading by the traders which it has increased, right? So, this is known as stock split when a company reduces or you simply you can say a company divides one of its share, uh, it divides its shares into smaller parts of lower priced shares, right? So, the major purpose to do this or carry out this activity is to increase trading activity in their, of their shares in market, right? I'm sorry. Okay. So, that is why statement E is correct. When stock split is implemented, number of its shares outstanding, it increases, increased from 10,000 to 1 lakh and the price falls, uh, price fell from 100 to 10. Right. So, let's say if there is a person, Mr. A, uh, Mr. X, Mr. X had 100 shares of A limited. Now, he is going to have 1000 shares. But earlier, these 100 shares, they were priced at rupees 100. So, 100 into 100, that makes it 10,000 worth of shares. And now, these 1000 shares, one is priced at 10. That still makes it 10,000. So, no difference between valuations right pre-split and post-split valuation they are same that is why option e is correct now let us understand some more things about stock split stock split when a company uh, divides existing shares of its stock i think we have discussed all this number of shares outstanding increases total value of shares remains the same and most common split ratios are 2 for 1, 3 for 1 although it can be anything that if someone is having one share it is going to be converted into two shares what I used in the example was 10 for 1 share right companies they choose to split their shares so that they can lower the trading price of their stock to a range deemed comfortable most by investors just, just as I told you to make investors more comfortable in trading and to increase the liquidity of shares. Now coming to one more topic which is a reverse stock split. So reverse, what we talked about now is a for, was a forward stock split in which uh, share is divided into smaller proportions. But reverse stock split is opposite of this where shares are consolidated. So if we use the same example, there were initially 100 rupee shares and there were 10,000 shares. Now, if the company thinks that I am going to increase the value of my share price, share to 1,000, that is going to make only 1,000 shares available for trading, right? So, do you see the price has increased whereas the number of shares has decreased. So, this is reverse stock split and this is usually done to reduce the liquidity if the if the share is very volatile so to reduce that volatility this is the, this step is undertaken right so i hope now you are clear with it this was asked by shivani and she had some doubts between share split and bonus issue see bonus is issued as a reward to existing shareholders that is why bonus does not increase uh, in in pre bonus and post bonus times the number of shareholders are not increasing because only the existing shareholders are getting new shares but obviously the number of shares they tend to increase so uh, let's say there are thousand shareholders of a company right and the comp and uh, let's say each of this thousand shareholders is holding 10 shares right that makes it 10,000 shares so 10,000 is the number of shares thousand is the number of uh, shareholders each shareholder holding 10 shares right now if the company says that we are going to provide let's say 10 shares to each 
of the shareholder that means they are adding new 10,000 share because these 1,000 shareholders, they are going to get additional 10 shares to what they are holding. So, the number of shares have increased, but the number of shareholders, it stays at 1,000 because only these are the getting, these shareholders are getting these new bonus shares, no new shareholder is coming to the, is coming into the scene, right? So, increases the number of shares, but the number of shareholders remain same. In case of stock split, as you just saw, the number of shares, floating shares, it obviously increases and the price, uh, the, sorry, the number of outstanding share, uh, shares for uh, trading increases and the price falls after a stock split, right? So, I hope Shivani, your doubt is cleared and if not, then you can obviously mention it on the video in comments, right? Okay, question number fourth here, which says B Limited wants to buy an insurance plan for its employees, but it is not able to do so, has contacted many insurance companies, but could not find a suitable plan. Looking at this, the CEO put forward an option to establish a fully owned subsidiary of B Limited, which can provide a tailor-made plan to B Limited. What type of company is the CEO looking to establish? So a company which is going to provide insurance to the parent company let's say what let's see what the correct option is and the correct option for this question is option d option d means captive insurance company right so captive captive means under the parent the company which is providing insurance so a company which is providing insurance to its own parent is a captive insurance company that ceo of b limit is, is looking to establish now, let us understand some more things about a captive insurance company. So, captive insurance company is a wholly owned subsidiary of its parent company, right? Provides risk mitigation services for its parent company or a group of related company. Let's say there is a big a conglomerate which has a lot of companies under it and it wants to buy some insurance scheme which covers all of its employees and it is not able to find something which suits to their needs, then they can go for setting a, another company under them called a captive insurance company, which is going to design a tailor-made plan for it, right? So that is the meaning of captive insurance or captive insure. And a company which provides such services is known as captive insurance company, right? So forming a captive insurance company can lower the insurance cost. Obviously, it also comes with some advantages and some disadvantages. So, simple se in simple sense, I think uh, you can guess it easily that the advantages are going to be that plan is going to be customized according to company's needs. But the downside is going to be that there are going to be higher costs because the uh, because a new company has to be established and uh, obviously it comes with establishment and running expenses. So, provide more specific coverages. So, many a times you want some diseases to be covered under insurance or you want some sort of other uh, under medical insurance or you want some other sort of damage control, dam uh, damage coverage under a type of insurance which is not provided by any company in the market, then this option is good because it is tailor-made. But also comes with the additional overhead of running a distinct insurer. So, okay, now we come to an important point here taxation aspect right so many times what big companies do they establish their captive insurance companies in a country which is a tax haven like bermuda or cayman islands so company will locate captive insurance in such tax havens to avoid to avoid adverse tax implications see let's say company a limited establishes a CIC captive insurance company called B Limited, right? Now, this A Limited would have to provide premium to B Limited <coughs> in order to take insurance services from it, right? So, money is flowing from A Limited to B Limited. Unless and until there is a claim, uh, B Limited is not going to pay to A Limited. Now, this premium is a cost for A Limited, and 
a revenue for B limited. So that is why it is going to be taxed here in B limited's country. So that is why this company has established B limited into a tax haven country so that the tax it has to pay is lesser. Obviously, it is a subsidiary. So uh, under consolidated accounts, the benefit goes to A limited as well. So the tax here B limited has to pay on its own a profit on the revenue generated is going to be lesser because it is established in a tax haven country. Whereas A limited, it is getting an exemption because of this cost, the cost of paying premium to insurance company in a country which is highly taxed country. So it saves some amount uh, in a highly taxed country and uh, pays some amount in a low taxation country. So benefit to it, right? So this is also one reason to set up a captive insurance scheme. So maybe form parent company cannot find a suitable plan. If premiums paid to captive insurance create tax savings, if insurance provided is more affordable, right? And if it offers better coverage for the parent company's risks. So many times if a company is in a special business where some uh, where the manufacturing process involves some different kind of risks to the employees and company wants coverage for it and a normal insurance company does not provide it. Let's say they produce some kind of uh, chemical which exposes the workmen or, uh, or employees to some sort of disease. sorry, which is not covered by a normal insurance company. In that case, they would have to set up their own insurance firm. Moving ahead to the next question. Before that, let me just check who asked this question. Captive insurance. Okay, this was asked by. Okay, um, so the name is missing. I hope uh, who asked it uh, gets benefited by this. Moving ahead. This is the last question for today, which says under dash taxation, each buyer in the supply chain pays a price based on its cost, including the previous tax or taxes that have been charged. So under which of the system tax on taxes charged moving ahead to the solution and the correct option is B that is cascading taxation. You must have heard the term cascading effect in relation to GST or VAT. Right. So in simple terms, cascading effect means tax on tax, which is prevented by the taxes like GST or value added. So now we use GST. One of the reason to bring out GST was to reduce the cascading effect. Let us try to understand it with the help of diagram here. So here you can see something which is priced at 100, it has a tax of 10% and the total price becomes 110. Fine till here. Now someone who buys this at 110 and let's say this is a raw material, right? This is raw material for producing something. Now it goes to the another say, stage where the purchase price is 110 and then again a 10% tax is applied on it. So guys, do you see it is this 10% is being applied on 110 which includes both the components the original price of 100 which has already been taxed and after that the 10 which has been added recently so it it it, it provides a taxation on the amount which has already been taxed not on value addition right so a, the 100 amount is being taxed again which increases the price of the commodity finally manufactured so to reduce this impact taxes like GST were brought in. Okay. So cascading tax system imposes sales tax products at each successive stage. Obviously it is being applied at different stages, the stages that are in a value chain or supply chain process, right from raw material to finally being purchased by a final consumer. Cascade tax is a tax on the top of tax. There is compounding effect with real sales tax higher than the official tax rate. So whatever is the tax rate, the ending result or the resultant tax becomes higher than that because of taxing again and again. You can understand it like the uh, compound interest, right? Let's say you deposited rupees 1000 
in bank and at the end of year 1 you get a 10% tax which makes your sorry 10% interest which makes your total deposit equal to 1100 now if in the year 2 if you are again provided with 100 interest we'll say that it is a simple interest but if you are provided interest on this 10% interest on new deposit also then it is going to be 110 right which gives you 1210 as final deposit whereas if this would have been 100 it would have been 1200 so you so there is a compounding effect because this 10% is also being applied on added component right so the similar sort of mechanism is at play in cascading tax it inflates the prices and the alternatives to it includes GST and value added tax. Now we use GST, everyone knows that. So guys, these were the five questions for today. Before ending the session, I would like to uh, take some doubts. Okay, many, I was getting many doubts. Uh, you guys were getting confused between YCC, operation twist, quantitative easing. We have discussed these terms in different sessions. So I hope uh, this chart helps you to understand them better you can take a screenshot of it if you want to and still if you have any doubt among these topics you can ask it on the comments in the comments on the video right so uh, people like ashish kartikeyan they were having some doubts about these topics so i hope you get helped by this apart from that okay uh, there were many doubts about uh, there were doubts about some articles that we are going guys don't worry we are going to discuss those articles in the upcoming sessions so stay tuned for it so so this is it for today and i hope to see you in the next session until then take care of yourself take care of your studies and thank you for being here